Is it A, 200,000, B, 43,000, C, 60,000, or D, 75,000? Pick your pick. Prison population like varies between like eighty five to kind of eighty nine ninety thousand people. Okay, so it is A, um, and that was actually more children than were affected by the rate of divorce in England that year. Um, and I kind of like the statistic. I don't like the statistic, but I like what it shows and what it communicates in that the prison population is dynamic. So it's not these random 85,000 people that are affected each year. It's like hundreds of thousands of people that are going in and out of the system or at some point interact with it. Um, <coughs> and two thirds of women in prison are parents. Um, and so you can kind of imagine the impact on those children's lives. Um, prisons kind of interrupt normal lives. So people will lose their jobs, they'll lose access to housing. Um, children will be taken away by social services which will result in kind of huge battles to kind of regain custody of children. So yeah, this is quite clear that prisons affect not just prisoners, but also their families and communities. All right, so now um, if you want to take a seat, Jules is going to talk about her project. Um, and then we'll, we'll return to some of these ideas afterwards. Thank you. My name's Jules Van Roy. I'm my back. <laughs> Just disconnected. Um, my background is as a chef and restaurateur um, in Manchester. I was doing local seasonal food, which I started from 2004 to around about five years afterwards. So the how I got into this is through. Um, I started, I suppose, I suppose the word is hyperlocal. This is one of some of the restaurants I had. It, it, um, I'd, I'd worked, I, I'd set up an Italian restaurant and realised that uh, you couldn't have um, Italian food in England that had authenticity. And I started thinking about local or English food and decided to set up a restaurant that only served English food. Yeah, 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 all through all my lean stories now. Uh, but when I went into the countryside, I found out there was no local food or very little local food. Um, there'd been big changes in the farming uh, around and I couldn't get the ingredients to make the recipes that were in the historical books. So in the, you know, thousand four five hundred years ago you had to have 18 ingredients you couldn't buy them and if you bought them they made you come from Holland or Ireland or China to make the food that used to be made locally so I started doing um, composting growing on the reef recycling um, and foraging uh, mostly that meant I went out and um, picked ingredients from the street or got rabbits from roundabouts and had to put food on the plate of this restaurant uh, and then I found out that that was just extra environmentalism or sustainability because I was using complete business background. I was just making a piece at a restaurant and I became part of a, a larger movement within Manchester. Moving on to that now, as, as we started to get more and more sort of hyper-local, we started to think, well, how can we... Um, grow in the smallest space as possible, the highest value of food. And this was also done designing 
tried to turn it around into a couple of good donors, a couple of caravans. We, we were doing the bigger than we could, obviously. And it was, in fact, the, you know, the problem was the solution. We needed to create five grow ingredients in small spaces. And I went and we done we done just five of those five. Mm. Then recently um, I started to talk about the or we started to find out not having enough food lo grow locally. And that was partly because the farmers were retiring. So you might know that say sixty is the average age of farmers in the UK. So many that's the average age was from 60, 70, 80, 90, some of but those people, those farmers were going to retire. And I started to think, well, who's farming? The countryside is empty. You know, the countryside is absolutely empty around Manchester. There are possibly 40 or 50 hectares of land being used to grow around a big city. It's the second city in the UK. And uh, but then bizarrely, we have the biggest centre of production for cannabis in the UK. Manchester, but also the South of the biggest area. We even export to Holland. Oh, it's a highly <laughs> successful business. And and if you look at the police helicopters flying above Manchester now, areas like it, you know, looking for the hemp for the grow land. And I have a real problem with this. Not with the drugs, I have a real problem with the energy use. I have a problem with the input, so a lot of the amount of fertilizer, <laughs> the cotton. <laughs> and I just think, well, you know, they're using very partial light to grow a weed in a spare or underground, you know, without light. And that is wrong. And when I speak to some of my friends who supply that industry, they say that one in 16 houses in my city has a farm inside it, so it's growing cannabis, minimum. Yeah? So it's it's a long it's a long a big part of the economy and incidentally this country is now paying money to Europe based on the criminal activity of the country as well. So we pay our GDP is gone up by three billion that we've got to prostitution and cannabis production. So we're paying for this in many different ways. So but I thought another thing is these people offer us really good skills. I mean, they're, they're growing, they're, they're taking closed loop ecosystems in a forest. They know about pH, nutrients, fertility. You know, they know they know how to keep plants alive and to grow. And and I thought maybe there's an opportunity there. The problem is the solution. Mm -hmm. This guy was it. There's the number of people in the UK prisons at Friday eight to six thousand. It's it's. Uh, a very, very, very high amount. So why are you sticking to farmers and caravans? You know, there's boys out there. Why, why are we doing this now, basically, converting a lean out oil field? Because it's a reliable oil year-round crop, clean food surfaces, off-grid, movable, cheap, it's already insulated and it's secure. Now, I, I know people, I try to have a conversation with the organic movement because drug mechanics are not organic. They thought that they could be. Now, obviously, it's good to keep the organic. It's a hydroponics you grow into a tree, a potting it does, but not vegetables. Or everything has to be in the soil. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but 85% of the vegetables in this country are grown hydroponically in water. 85%. And they're not organic. So let's just step back from this. So the ethics of growing in an unnatural way. There's the argument that you're supplying everything a plant needs for life to be most productive, to increase the yield. You're making the plant happy. And I believe that it, it grows better. So you get a lettuce that will grow in um, sunny days. From seed to, to full grown lettuce. Um, you're using less water. You're not putting, you can put fertiliser in, but you're using no fungicides, no pesticides, just the seed. Wrap it and you have 30% more nutrients. So you can increase the flavour and the nutrients in the plant. You can alter it. 
and that's the thickening of droplets inside the water and increasing the opacity of the plants themselves. So you can get 10 times more yield growing in a space this big than you can grow 100,000 times worth of crop. Or you can save your fields being used and you can make it harder later and you can grow wild trees. And so there, there are arguments back and forth. Can permaculture principles apply? I very likely so. I just don't put it down because it's going to all affect from the website, the permaculture association, it's going to all fall out. It's all left as what it is. What's a, a permaculture principle? So, I don't know. Do you want to talk through that? Or leave it? No? Want to pick one? Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, I went to a separate people because it was so different. So, you could say, so let me just say the hydroponic system, relative location, yeah, fixed location. And it's pretty designed, it's exactly to, so if you want to use lucky fields or rhubarb or fingers, or whatever, you could do for different effects. And you design the system for them. Um, equal amounts of water and functions? Yeah. Um, this system that we have at the moment, which is a, basically a box with lighting, with trimming, um, it's it performs. It, you can get more economic value off it. You can also it's therapeutic. You're also producing fuller cocoons that have a high nutritive value. So yeah, everybody in the room, you know, everybody can say that there's benefit to that. Efficient energy planning. Mm, yeah, you can generate renewables, but to be honest, the technology is all orientated to growing cannabis. And they don't care what they spend on energy. Um, using biological resources, yes. Um, obviously, food, soil, water, it's a point. Cycling, yes, it's a point. Small scale intensive, yes. Diversity of hypothesis. Attitudinal chemistry, everything works in both ways. And perfect chemistry is sort of information and imagination on the chemistry. I, I'd say definitely, because this is one of the most has a massive area of interest on the internet as well from amongst communities that don't have access to land. And I live in a large city, which I've seen the teaching that we went through. We, yeah. went, we went through the whole thing of wanting to get out into the countryside, to traffic um, communes or transmission communities, and found because of the global um, stock market going down the land, gold or land, we can't afford to buy or even rent the land around our city. So if you look into the countryside, you can see all that actually that is all part of the property relationship. That is all part of the property. The house, the field, it's just part of the property. It's an asset and an investment. So we don't, we, this whole movement, when it's up against a wall, I find that we have nowhere to go. So that's when people get more and more interested in local areas and local urban areas and then other learning well what's the well there are policies in place this year about for projects and why it's part of criminal justice and why the justice system has changed um, this project has been supported it's a, it's a sort of it's a very quick farm but a hydroponic farm in a caravan and fifty bush owners and Arrowhead um, by the NHS. And it's it's part of the NHS that's dealing with um, drug dependency. So again it's in people who want to make a change and having a drug dependent lifestyle. And they realise that part of that is reconnecting with nature, having a job having a purpose if you like or being part of a community so unusually this project isn't just about it's not just a commercial uh, project it's it's setting up a philosophy and I think that is the biggest thing all, all of us are saying about it because instead of the hierarchical prison in power it's it's actually putting these farms inside the prison and all the people inside it will have equal rights you know one person one vote and I, and I think this is, is more of a cultural change for the prisons and they, they don't even understand the importance
more people died at that moment as well. So other learning. So the working with nature where we were going to today, yes, it's carbon pollution, really is different. But I think the benefit we said of the therapeutic horticulture, like you, you said you came up with going in schools, people then worked on horticulture. There's a very strong within the UK prison system there are therapeutic horticulture sites with um, commercial ones and illegal ones that help with mental health and people who suffer from mental health within and and they have a separate political pur purpose than the ones which are basically manufacturing or growing plants for a large supermarket and they're treated differently however the back there's a very little resort research on what's the value of growing things um, designing systems to put in public domain issues <coughs> things like if I want to del make a delivery to a prison, you have to have security clearance. Uh, in some prisons, it's almost like going abroad, going to the airport. Uh, you have to bring passports in and go through a, a, a security check. There's also designing a, a, a farm that's transparent. I've been asked to design a transparent farm for possible air prisons because mm -hmm. the main way of getting contraband and then that and you can have a sentence of 10 years bringing a, mo um, a mobile phone into a prison is through things like fraud so if you were to bring a bag of fraud into a prison they would have to report that you've had a bag of fraud or any con contraband using illegal going into the prison so they actually like that to punish because they say they will have a transparent mm -hmm. box which nobody can smuggle contraband into. It's like the Oxford people who are running away. <laughs> yeah. Apart from the, the prison officers, people who are running away from the system. Yeah, not quite easy. <laughs> yeah. So, but obviously they, they, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I also am really interested in the fact that many prisons are by nature in large, on large pieces of land in huge computer size and have you know, access to a large supply of labour for their prisoners. And however, they are on the whole, when I've discussed it, and I don't know your reflections on this, absolutely against organic. Don't be far from permaculture. They're absolutely against organic. They're committed to that bullshit. They only want to grow real things for real people. Yeah. Yeah, that, and, and, and I just think that, so I've tried to talk to them about getting a, a crop that doesn't farm their, 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 their prison population and also possibly makes more money and there's no hassle and try to, but on the whole they're having such gut reactions and, and I've, when I've seen people farm, it's sometimes quite brutal. There's almost, not obviously in the male prisons, they tend to try uh, an aggressive approach to the land that's all about, uh, it's almost like an army attitude to like kill it. No, uh, you know, and then that's just my perception. Um, transient incarceration, I think we talked about this, I looked into it a bit more. I just wonder if, and as much as this would be, a, 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 a really doing a little stunt, if prisons actually represent almost the furthest point from permaculture that's possible at land many levels. Um, the, the idea of prisons seems almost to deprive people of nature and um, almost to brutalise them and that works very, very well um, within urban populations like Manchester. Uh, and anecdotally, a lot of the populations in the prisons that I visited in, in Manchester and just outside don't feel comfortable with um, horticulture. They don't feel comfortable in a field. They feel more comfortable in a box or in a controlled environment. And again, this is reasons why um, hydroponics might help. So just to conclude, and I'm still saying really, uh, the Farming Limited is a, is a project for setting up six microfarms in Manchester. And if you want to get in touch with me at any time, just use those numbers or Google me and you'll have 
briefly introduce the prison system at the beginning, um, but I wanted to hear from people just if you could speak to the person next to you about your first memory of prison, like a cultural memory, so maybe a TV show or a film or something your, your mother said to you, for example. Um, if you could just take like one minute to talk to the person near you and then, and then we'll give that back. borders and prisons and it's actually something I'll talk about in a second but I'm really sorry that you had that experience. Um, like this idea of it is like repressive or kind of radical ideas or social change mm. okay uh any last comments Um, picture up. I tried to find a picture of like 
from those months that the quality wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But this is from Toy Story. Um, and actually, you can see that the toys have been like naughty, so they're kind of put in crates um, as a kind of prison, and then they're patrolled by Buzz Lightyear, who's gone, gone away. Um, but it kind of shows how like normalized prisons are in our society. Um, so like in permaculture, we often look at like functions, like what's the function of a system. So prisons are kind of sold to us as being like a way to solve like social and economic problems or political problems. Um, and throughout growing up, like we're kind of given this narrative that they're completely natural and normal and necessary. And even for people that want to change things, we can't change the prison system. We can't abolish it. You know, that's crazy. But yet somehow we can maybe abolish capitalism or, or you know achieve a permaculture paradise or something. So yeah, they're kind of sold to us as this yeah really natural, normal, necessary system. Um, and the state has a kind of monopoly on safety, so the prisons provide safety to the rest of the population. Um, okay, so I'm just going to introduce this idea of the prison industrial complex. Has anyone heard the phrase before? Cool. So um, a really inspiring scholar and activist from the US, Dylan Rodriguez, says we are collectively witnessing, surviving, and working in a time of unprecedented state-organized human capture and state-produced physical, social, and psychic alienation. So I think this link to the state is really important, but the pri prison industrial complex broadens that because it's not just about the state, it's also about the state's relationship with private companies. Um, so this idea of a complex kind of highlights the, the complexity. Um, so just because we don't want to focus on problems at the complex, we want to look at solutions. I think it is important to look at problems as well. Um, the prison industrial complex in the UK, you know, is harming like thousands of people. Um, but yeah, so a big part of that is like immigration detention. All of the detention centres in England are run for profit um, and Corporate Watch an NGO here produced a report where they valued, calculated the labour that private companies were making from detainees. And it was something like, I don't know, like 28 million a year or something. Um, <coughs> yeah. So if I can just jump in there. Sorry, yeah. 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 Did you say that the Jersey prisons are in your state? Or oh, yeah, they're all run by private companies by for own. profit. Ooh. Yeah. In England, we only have 15, well, 16 prisons that are run for profit. Um, oh. <laughs> um, but generally, like most state prisons will have relationships with companies, but they're not privately run. Um, but the complex in the UK, like we had the first private pr pr uh, prison in Europe, um, started by G4S, who were a subsidiary of the Whack and Punch Corrections Corporation in America. So. It's been a very strategic business plan to bring the private prison system into the UK. Um, and it's not just the prisons, it's also, you know, um, like tagging, for example, or like transportation of prisoners, which again are also hugely profitable. Um, and in UK jail, prison labor is like a really serious thing um, with companies making huge profits uh, from basically a captive labor force. Um, and this picture on the right is from a report called Future Prisons, which was produced by David Cameron's favorite think tank, um, who proposes to close down several prisons in high land value areas, like central London, and then open these mega prisons for like two and a half thousand people, 5,000 people on the outskirts of cities. Um, they're implementing these changes already, starting with the North Wales Prison Project, which is Europe's second biggest prison currently being built um, by Lendley, who Jonathan Porritt introduced this morning mm -hmm. as being a case study of, of construction. Um, <coughs> yeah, and they're planning to, to build one of these in West London as well, so you can see that on the internet. So, do people think prisons are compatible with permaculture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can, we can debunk this now. Um, <laughs> But for me, like this idea of like the two ethics, like caring for the earth, you know, prisons are basically like new villages in an area that are all supplied by like outside inputs. And there's a really interesting project in the US called the Prisons Ecology Project, 
which is looking at the kind of environmental harm of the prison system and how that harm is like disproportionate to like people of color and like poorer communities, working class communities. Um, in terms of like care for people, I don't feel that the prisons <laughs> are in any way like caring or should even go near that ethic. Um, and in terms of like distribution of wealth, we do see that prisons harm, you know, the, the people at the bottom, poor people, people of color, foreign nationals, immigrants, disabled people, people with mental health problems, drug users, the homeless, yeah, you know. Children. Yeah, and their children and their families. So I don't think they're compatible. Um, so yeah, so prisons are like inherently violent and oppressive. And I guess where I'm coming from is that because of its inherent violence by design, I don't feel they can be reformed. But we can go into that again. Um, nor do I think that kind of therapy or healing can come through coercion. I think if people do well in prison in the sense that maybe they gain a qualification or they learn new skills, I think you're an exception to the rule, basically. Um, and prisons don't meet the needs of survivors of harm. So I'm really hoping no one in this room has you know, gone through sexual violence or supported a friend who's maybe experienced rape. But if you have, you'll know that how they feel like talking to the police is generally like very dehumanizing and stressful and the thought is stressful. And their self-determination over managing that situation is stolen from them. So I guess the premise of what I'm saying is that prisons don't meet the needs of people who are harmed. Um, and that's really important because those people should be at the center of our kind of justice system. Um, and even if you don't feel that, there's actually very little evidence that prisons actually work or reduce harm in any way. You know, the reoffending rate in England is phenomenal. Um, so they're not even effective, even if you don't think you should be involved. Um, and ultimately, the main thing is that caging people doesn't solve the social kind of problems in, the, in our society, like racism or sexism or drug abuse or anything else. Okay, so thankfully, some people have been thinking about this already and been organizing for decades to try and create a different society and abolish our prison system. Another really inspiring author and ex-prisoner is Angela Davis, who says an abolitionist approach would require us to imagine a constellation of alternative strategies and institutions with the ultimate aim of removing the prison from the social and ideological landscape of our society. And I love this quote because it really <coughs> mentions like landscape and I feel with permaculture, we are redesigning our social landscape as well as our physical landscape. Um, and actually the hardest work with doing work around prisons isn't so much, you know, actually, you know, creating alternatives or knocking them down. It's removing this idea from our brains that they're like naturally normal or necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, the, that's the hard work to do. Okay. Um, so this idea of prison abolition is that it's a political vision with the goal of eliminating policing, prisons and surveillance and creating lasting alternatives to punishment in prisons. So it's both a practical organizing tool and a long-term goal. So having this, this worldview, I guess, an abolitionist worldview informs like every decision I make, you know, whether I call the police, whether I, um, you know, which projects I get involved with, which funders I work with, you know, it affects everything. And in terms of permaculture, um, I feel like there are some really amazing kind of things that permaculture offers to prison abolition. Um, so, you know, this idea of kind of building a prison free world, like when you want to fight against the prison system and you want to create alternatives, I can't think of any other movement that is so impressive in actually creating on the ground, real needs orientated alternatives than permaculture. Um, so this idea of creating cultures of care and safety and accountability and kind of using design to really think about those different systems that can actually meet our needs and keep us safe. Um, you know, working for freedom of movement and resisting borders and resisting oppression in that way. Um, supporting people to meet their own economic needs, um, access to healthy food, access to housing, um, you know, all of these things are really important interventions that we can make to, you know, create a world where prisons are unnecessary, but also support ex-prisoners and current prisoners and people disproportionately affected by the prison system. Um, <coughs> and also this educational alternative thing is about the connection
system between people that are excluded from school and how they end up in the prison system and there's huge relationships there so I know lots of people in homosexual roles and homo bisexual roles kind of education and I think that plays a big role so um, another question for people maybe this time just think about it on your own but like what would you need if you experienced some sort of harm so say you went out on the street now and someone like you know robbed you for your phone or pushed you over or you witnessed a fight in a pub or you know experienced some sort of sexual assault like what what would you personally need okay can you just take a minute everyone had a chance to think of something? Does anyone feel comfortable to share? Yeah? Um, maybe even like think of an idea that you'd like to experience. Maybe you just come to me and you can tell me how it was for you or you can tell me what you did and you can just tell me. Okay. Cool. Is that similar to what other people have had? to have some sort of accountability like with that person maybe looking to you or knowing that yeah, yeah. that can just be like an idea and feel like someone just needs to tell me about it mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah so all of these things does anyone think they're kind of what the criminal justice system at the moment offers us no, no? <laughs> okay so this is what i mean by the prison system is completely ineffective at meeting the needs of prisoners like who might have perpetrated some crime or harmed someone or something, um, and people that have experienced that harm themselves, you know, as like the victim. Um, yeah, so it just highlights that, you know, it doesn't doesn't meet our needs. Um, so this back to the Angela Davis quote, she she kind of says like this constellation of alternatives, and people are always chatting to me about jail and like, well, well, what's the alternative, Nicole? Blah 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 blah. And I'm like, well, why is it? Why is it in the singular? Why isn't it in the plural? You know, communities all over the world are completely different with completely different histories. Um, so we need like a whole constellation of alternatives. Um, and this graphic is from a project called Generation Five, who has been working um, to kind of challenge like child sexual abuse in, in um, First Nations communities in Canada. Super inspiring work. And they describe transformative justice as a liberating new way to end child sexual abuse and other forms of violence. Um, so for them, the biggest things are like safety, healing, and agency for survivors, accountability and transformation for people who are abused and being harmed, community action, healing, and accountability. So we're not just seeing like a single approach, you know, a single person, it's like a collective process. Um, transformation of the social conditions that perpetuate violence. Um, so I had an ex-boyfriend who did five years inside and he said the worst thing about it was like how other men in the prison would talk about women and how they would talk about rape and you know that we look like rape when we get out for example so when people say to me well rapists need to go in prison i say that it's not going to change them being in prison okay it might keep the survival away like safe for like two and a half years or something but ultimately the prison is like a completely sexist patriarchal environment and a system that perpetuates sexism so it's not going to get to the root cause of, of why people are harming each other. All right, and my last slide is about if people are interested in doing projects with prisoners or around prisons, I guess these are just things I like to flag up that I think people that do that need to inform themselves about prison abolition and critical perspectives. 
um, and for people to look at their own motives and privilege in that situation. Um, and ideally that projects are like prisoner led and prisoner centered um, and to ensure that like everyone stays critically aware so there's reflection between yourselves and the, the prisoners that you're working with to kind of see if your project is perpetuating prison or making it look nice or making it function better or if it's kind of radically changing lives um, and being aware of this idea of the not-for-profit industrial complex so are our kind of reforms being assimilated because we need to get grant money or whatever to function um, and just generally like if you care about prisons I think the biggest thing you can do is be part of a movement that's fighting against prisons that's working with prisoners um, yeah and just challenging projects that kind of naturalize or normalize or perpetuate the prison industrial complex including the kind of rehabilitation approach you know this isn't just about individual prisoners changing their lives this is about total transformations of like class and race and gender relationships in our society if we really want to make a difference. So yeah, inspiration and fun resources. Um, someone in the collective I work with produced a zine called <coughs> What About the Rapist? So like anarchist approaches to crime and justice. You can download it on the internet. It's already mentioned Generation 5. Um, Incite, uh, Women of Colour Against Violence. It's been doing some like incredible work exploring alternatives and documenting um, strategies for responding to harm without state violence. Um, Critical Resistance is an organisation in the US who have been organising for abolition um, and produced tons of resources and materials. And maybe Pandora could just introduce Pathways to Resilience quickly, is that okay? As an inspiring example? <laughs> sure, okay. So, you know, an inspiring project working with people leaving the prison. And then finally, the collective I'm involved in, which is called the Empty Cages Collective. And we have a, a campaign network called Community Action on Prison Expansion. So if you live in Wales or London or any other part of the UK, and a jail might be coming to you, a mega prison, then please get in touch because we can make your mobilizing against them. Um, we produce publications. We're doing a report with Corporate Watch about the prison industrial complex in the UK. And we do workshops like this with all sorts of groups of people and we're hopefully working with the IWW, the Anarchist Union, to instigate more like prison labour organising in, in the UK. And that's me. Um, so now we're going to have... <laughs> Sorry I'm late. I was supposed to be hosting this session and I got hideously lost on the other side of the building. And so it's kind of self-hosted, which is fantastic. Thank you both for a really good speech. Just to give you a little, a little frame-in, um, everything I've heard here has been, you know, has been really fantastic. And just to sort of take it to, to a wider picture, um, I'm the founder of an organization called the International Center for Holistic Law. Um, and what we've heard today about prisons is just one, um, one symptom of a structure of law that is essentially mechanistic and reductionist. Rather than taking a whole systems approach, human societies, as we all know, are living systems, and we need to have structures of law that deal with human beings in a holistic way. Um, in our work, we also look at different systems in different societies. And in a lot of countries where they still have um, indigenous uh, law, like in Australia, in um, Hawaii, and places like that, there have been these projects where um, um, prisoners from those backgrounds have been um, have had the option to be dealt with by the local co in the traditional way by the local community, which is always a healing approach for reintegration, and um, and and these projects have been very successful where they've been carried out. There was one case I don't know if anybody's heard of Tora Tomatomo. It's the Polynesian healing, a uh, traditional healing ceremony, and um, there was a prison in Hawaii, which was, um, you know, it, it was one of those top security prisons and nobody would ever go there because it was 
you know, it's actually a terrible and they, they brought in this psychologist who was also a hair Kanekano practitioner and he said he would not speak to any of the prisoners he would just come into his office but he wanted a book with each one of their photographs in it and he would come into the office for just two hours every day and he would do the hair Kanekano ceremony for each of the prisoners and within two years the prison was shut down because there was no need for a prison anymore all these guys were well and healthy and healed so you know I'm what, what I'm hearing here are ways of bringing healing into the prison one, one advocating for a different approach and the other you know saying hey why don't we take some bring some of the healing into the prison and bring it in a way that is appropriate for the culture here and addressing some of the issues like the disconnection with nature at the same time so I just want to bear in the you know bigger picture in mind as well open it to the floor for questions for these two wonderful women well for anyone who wants to come in yeah comments and thoughts Um, so there are some differences, but not many. Um, we do have comrades from Scotland that are organising, um, generally composed of new women's prison, which is called Trample. Um, so just for our examples of some of the people I know in Edinburgh. Yeah, the main reason the statistics are centred on those countries is because they come from this thing called the Bromley briefing, which is like the kind of the only data set, I guess, about about prisons produced by the Prison Reform Trust. Um, yeah, it's just because of that. Yeah. with a mix of prisons on the end of Cross Street. I thought yeah. they're very yeah. but they look I mean they talk about food as well in prisons. I mean you you if you have holes in it, you just often think about perhaps the disposal because people will just not have yeah. food. So they set for food because people have got you know menus that are the same every other week. They are eating the same food all the time. And uh, there's also an issue of malnutrition and overnutrition because those prisoners come out much more, much heavier. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, it's a food disease. I just, in response to your comment, I feel like, if anything, you know, they're kind of pretty full of very uh, surplus of drugs, if I could like to put it that way or whatever. Mm -hmm. I feel like, actually, it's not that we need more projects working with the probation service, it's that we need more projects working with people who are going to end up interacting with the probation service so we need to think about like access and permaculture and like privilege and who is coming to our projects and who is excluded from them um, so that mm. we can make the probation service redundant one day. Mm. Yeah. And I think we should almost dismantle the probation service. It feels like the system is creating the chaos it needs to bring in fully privatised prisons. Mm. Mm. Do you want to say what the probation officer does? I don't know what the technical yeah. term is. I have a very different okay. experience with it, probation. It's, it's <laughs> when you come out of prison, it's supposed to 
make your transition into the community easier. It's a process. Or or how do you?
to go. And I've got to say, I've never come across the idea of looking for these while going into prison or before mm. going to get any housing or prison system. Just like I've not been into hospital or school and I've got into palliative care. And just like I've never heard Julian Eber or Colin say, actually, I've been coming up with ten years not to have children because of how they treat people outside. Mm. It's one of those, when you have a dominant system that's working to provide a salary and a livelihood for the people within it, and they almost enjoy the palliative structure. It, it, um, yeah, I, I'm really interested to know how that can change. But it's also the situation of the people who do get into the system. I mean, when we were looking at the youth, um, the younger ones, they yeah. actually had to work really hard. They had to work really hard. But when they come out of prison, they have really good jobs. Mm. And they're often really well educated. Stuff that I was talking about last time is blocking the brain and seeing the power and the pull of it in, and obviously they want to see, but they're also talking about rehabilitation because that impact is painful to think about if you feel that it's part of you. So they're reorganising the prison system and so basically if the as they leave prison the last 18 months to a year don't contain the services, they contain the services, like you said, why shouldn't we do that for everybody? But it's um, it's whether there's also a mentality of you know you can make a big talk around the fact of, of, of people evil inherently evil the public you know evil and I hardly know anybody who isn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Mark says hand in hand with um, the job the general public asks is the perception and the perception of somebody of a person who has become socially damaged, you know, socially harmed in a way to the degree that they would harm another person and end up in prison, has been portrayed in such a negative way over so many decades in our society that I, you know, I feel that the average person, you know, like my mum or somebody like that, who said we're going to abolish prisons, would be, <gasps> you know, as if there was these crazy people are going to be everywhere and looting and plundering and and so we need to really, you know, work with education so that the general perception of why, what, what the causation of crime is, the systemic causation of crime is, and how we address those systemic social issues goes hand in hand with an abol abolition of projects. Because without that, I don't think people would be up for it because the understanding isn't there. Several and I've seen all of those pictures and it's just really disgraceful to have the women that have been seen as the scapegoats and some of the women that have been up and talking about stealing and the power and such and you know we've done our community forum for making sure that the jobs are held by by so many such and so many people and and the issues in it and we see it um, on film just as well but also I just I know I want to do things um, have a lot of ideas like a movie film and something like that where the story is within the prison and there's no music and then like how crazy would you say like that's how things start to kick in you know like <laughs> it's a, what did you think I do and and then we have you know the jobs and stuff like that and I was thinking oh yeah that's great this could work with but then I go going to prisoners no it's like in this case we are having to like bring them out so stuff like that and we just went out from prison and I thought oh maybe but they can just see how it works and I just thought how people So when the mind is confused, new possibilities can emerge. You've just got a lot of new information yeah. there that you didn't know. And uh, you know, my recommendation would be to sit with that and and see what emerges. And it will. I think if people are worried about projects and if they are if they're being seen as like the people who are seen as the people coming out of prison, mm -hmm. which is important. I think people they're so likely to go back to jail. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of 
leverage that I like you know you can really introduce to get people into writing mm -hmm. back. You can have them write emails right now and you can learn from how to get them to work with you know how what you can say back to them basically. Like um my friend uh a good friend called Shaden who I did Pi with who's been in and out of jail her whole life. Um from the care system, heroin user Prison news library and stuff, and then got out, and she got a job with a post young child doing gardening, and she still has that job, and mm -hmm. she's been out of prison for three years now, and she's like got a livelihood and got skills, and she's able to like a piece of shit, you know, like that's mm. the side of child care. So even though I was like critique the kind of liberal social enterprise that was doing this and this, actually that kept her out of jail, you know, that project vision of someone like starting something has prevented her from being put in a cage for like however many more years she mm. ends up in prison. Mm. Yeah. I would just suggest like just you know, just go for it. Like this is all learning. Like no one knows how to hold the prison mm. system. Mm. Like, you know, we might have got there in front of you. It's all learning, it's all new projects, it's the edge, it's kind of yeah, pioneering mm. stuff I guess. And yeah. I mean Manchester has had a third of the male population that's on the streets has had has a single letter of reprieve in prison so mm -hmm. it's it's not out yeah. there it's definitely mm -hmm. there. Um, also so I, I have a restaurant and we employ chefs to do some catering sometimes for other prisons but I also have a new way of doing it um, it and there are now some of the the, the prison system is saying well actually we need to get people jobs but it's not just about jobs it's about hope putting them in the community and that's the most thing that has happened. So they're getting they're getting a role and getting an identity that is not at the centre, not around um, criminality and oppression. So it's helping them. speaking was uh, a friend of mine has a project in Brazil where he works with um, the mafia and the police uh, it's called the Shaded Circle and um, basically um, it's, not a, it's not bringing in a permacultural map or a design that comes through the whole system but the way he works with the people involved in the system is by bringing everybody together with their entire social context so when he has a restorative circle the prison guards will be there, the lawyers will be there with their families, together with the, the person who committed the crime, with his family, and the, the person you know, who was the victim, with their family. And then they have these holistic discussions about how it's affected everybody in there, and then within those circles, healing happens. So this particular project has been very successfully replicated you know, all around the country. Um, he's got it going in 22 countries around the world. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what came to mind. But this work of mapping a permacultural design model on the prison system is a nice project for somebody who would like to do that work. I don't know anybody that's actually doing that at the moment. Which is like protecting 
identify the property and go with color. Um, so I feel that a lot of conclusions would like necessarily involve a lot of images. And I think any social functions that they do do, which try to rationalize or justify why they exist, they only serve those functions because they're so alienated and atomized through classes and, and through how hierarchical our societies are. So for example, you know, like healthy old women, you know, have fallen over at the shop and or what the archetypal police officer might do, um, I think match their actual function, which is like repressing any kind of radical change or redistribution of wealth. Um, but I'm not, you know, I know individual prison officers might be in that role because they, they feel they're serving their community. But I think to think on like a systems level, we have to think what's the function of this system. And I, I feel like their, si their function is like inherently repressive. Um, that's just my opinion.
when you're saying about, um, you know, this radical shift, if the shift in the justice system from a paradigm that's based on retribution, yes. which is really what you're talking about, you know, we want to hang them, we want to, you know, we want to get rid of them. Exactly. Yeah. Retribution is the paradigm of restoration, reparation, and healing. And um, and I feel that we are at the stage in society where people are waking up to that. Um, so I remain hopeful. general population is saying that the effects of that are going to happen. Certainly not all of them are going to be able to do so in the immediate future. I think it's probably going to happen. Okay, do we have some some voices there in the back? So, just to conclude, um, so we've had, we've taken a look at, you know, the systemic causation of the problems in prison, um, some of the, the arguments for getting rid of prisons completely and having another way of, of dealing with people who have somehow strayed from the path. Um, we've had a look at some projects of how can we make prisons better, how can we you know, get um, people connected with nature and uh, using skills that, that they originally had in a different way, in a more holistic way. Um, and then we've also had a lot of voices from the floor, taking, you know, right down to looking at our whole economic system from neoliberal um, 
model of economics, which is you know coming to the stage of its own self-combustion anyway. Um, and um, and the question is, uh, wow, it's so big. Would it ever happen? <laughs> um, so I still would like to say that I feel that um, that there is there is change happening, there is transformation happening slowly on the ground to people people's consciousness, and when a certain number of people get it, everybody gets it. So I really want to thank everybody for being here and thank the wonderful our wonderful presenters here for doing what we're doing, and thank you all for doing what we're doing. Because as we all do what we do, that's how everybody gets it. Mm -hmm.